So today I want to talk about plants that um, eat or digest or, or take mainly insects and then sort of digest them with similar kind of chemicals that we have inside our body and then take the nutrients and that helps the plants grow. Okay, are we ready? Um, yeah, for the, can everyone hear Terry okay? Great. Better make um, a good Macintosh. <laughs> Hi, Dennis. Hi, everyone. Hi, Nina. So if you look at some of the plants I have, like this one, and I'll be using some big names like Saracenia, but we don't worry about that. This is a pitcher plant, and it has pitchers. See these things here? And they are hollow. So a bug goes in there, and there's water up to here, and there's hairiness there so the bug can't get out and the bug drowns. And then with all that water, there's digestive enzymes go in and the bug is digested. So those are called pitcher plants. Now I have other kinds of pitcher plants. I've got this one. Now this one we showed you last week and it's dormant. So it, all these pitchers died last year. And um, then you have these winter leaves, but his same kind of thing. See the hole in the top of the pitcher? Anyway, the insects go in there, they get trapped. But in this picture, there's no water in it. Just they just sit in there and they die. Cats are having a fight in case you hear something. Now, with those pitcher plants in the, in the spring, what I do is I cut off all the leaves like this so there's no more pitchers. But if we do this again in the summertime, you'll see baby pitchers come up and flowers will come up from there to do new pitchers. And those, remember, we call those plants from last week dormant. So they rest over, over the winter time. Now we have here, and I'm going to just pull this out because we're, what the heck, eh? In this bog here, I've got baby pitcher plants. See them? These baby pitcher plants are really cool. And um, they are from seeds, which I didn't expect. My hands are getting really wet. Remember last week I showed you things drip out of the sphagnum moss. Anyway, these things are really cool and they'll eventually grow up into that big pitcher plant I had before. We also have another kind of pitcher plant. This is one where a scientist got together and they made one. This is a pitcher plant that has hoods. It hasn't quite grown this year, but it has little hoods. These are hollow and this little hood opens up. So the insect goes in there and gets trapped. Notice how pretty this is. Now, remember last week, I also told you plants are green. Well, yes, some plants are green. Other plants are red like this or clear, they're white, but they still have the green chemical inside, chlorophyll. It's been hidden by the red stuff. So they're still able to produce their own um, sugars and things. Here is Mela. I've got a cat in the way. <laughs> Bella's tail. Here's the most interesting pitcher plant of all. It's from California and Oregon. Sometimes they call it the parrot pitcher plant. So have a look at that. It's really weird. And if you look upside, it's hard to see it, but there's a big hole under there. Now, remember I said pitcher plants catch insects. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, that's an old leaf, and I'm going to cut off that leaf like this. I need some paper towel. Just a second. I'm oh. going to get some paper towel. Be back in a minute. <laughs> Here we go. Observe Bella in her natural habitat. Okay. Okay, so. Notice these jeans, I ripped them so they're worth more money. Anyway, that's beside the point. I have got those ripped because I do field work. Remember last week I mentioned that a lot of botanists do field work. I ripped those on some barbed wire while climbing. Now, here's a picture from that California plant, the parrot plant or Darlingtonia. See there, insects go in there and they have these fancy little lips so insects can land on them and then get caught. So what we're gonna do, <coughs> excuse me, is cut off this part, it's going to die this picture anyway, doesn't feel any pain. And we're going to look inside the top there. Notice all the cool veins and stuff. These are very beautiful in the summer. So the insect goes in here and comes out through there and goes down the tube. And let's see what's at the bottom. You see all this dark stuff? I wonder what that is. So we're going to cut it. Do do da. And go. You can do it on the table if you want. I could, eh? Oh, well, yeah, probably better on the table. I just have to move all this other stuff away. Let's see what's inside. And we go. These things all wrap around really crazily. 
Now, something about if there's kids out there listening, and I know there are, if you get old, one of the things that happens is you, um, your eyesight doesn't end up being so good. So I have to put on glasses, so I'm just putting on my glasses. So see where all that purple is? We open that up and what's in there? Bugs, lots of bugs. I'm gonna clean those out. All those bugs were caught last summer. Look at that. Now looking at those bugs, now, if you look behind me here, by the way, see these things, these are called microscopes. And what I would do is I'd put those fly heads, they're mostly flies, I'd put them under the microscope and I, I could maybe identify some of them. But most of these are heads of flies, but where'd the bodies go? Well, they were digested at the bottom of this by enzymes, just like in your tummy. So let's try another one, because that was fun. Let's do, uh, oh, let's see, I, oh yeah, one of these guys, big ones. I'll find one that's got lots of stuff in it. Oh, that's got lots of stuff in it. So the same thing with this guy. See how it's dried up? Cut off its head like that. Oop. See if we can find any other kinds of insects in here. It's pretty interesting, actually. You can find yellow jackets. I used to sell these to people for their barbecue, around their barbecue, so that they could get rid of all those yellow jackets. Oh, look in there. More flies. Lots of flies in the neighborhood. Look at that. There's probably, oh, maybe 20 or 30. So these plants, one leaf caught 20 or 30 of these things. Anyway, here's another pitcher plant, by the way, that's purple, that's really green. This is one, remember last week, I told you about my bog habitats and all these sphagnum mosses. This thing's kind of died back for the winter, but otherwise, now this is like the first one I showed you. It's got these really cool hairs. I don't know if you can see them in there. So when the bug goes in, he can't get out. With this one I showed you over here, the Darlingtonia, the bug gets in and it can't get out because it can't figure out how to get out. With these ones here, the one I just cut open, those are slippery inside and the bug can't get out. Anyway, that's one kind of plant, one kind of carnivorous plant. That's a pitcher plant, but we've got more. Get this riffraff out of here. The next one I'd like to show you is the sundew. Now sundews, they don't have pitchers. What they've got are fancy leaves, which have um, little hairs on the end and all of those hairs have sticky stuff. See all the hairs with the goop on them? Now let's see if I can get a good one. So if an insect comes along bzzz, and gets a hold of it, it gets stuck. Can you see those little things? Bella, my cat Bella, the bad girl this morning, she got stuck in one, but it wouldn't hurt you. Now, some people think pitcher plants and, and uh, sundews can hurt you, but they're completely harmless to you as a person and most animals, right? Because they're very weak in most cases. So these are really cool. So if I took off, well, I don't have to take off the leaf, but you see how the hairs go around. Now what happens is an insect gets caught like here. There's a couple of insects that have gotten caught here and here. When they get caught, the hairs go around them. They go down to the leaf and digestive enzymes go up and gobble them up and they take all the good goodies. That's one kind of um, sundew. The, the, the name for sundews in science is called drosera. But anyway, here's another one. Here's one which splits its leaves goes this way, this way, and it too. This one's even stickier. Look at this, it's stuck to my hand. Really cool. And it actually tastes good. No, I don't want to taste it because it might have bug juice on it. And there's a baby one in there. There's lots of little babies growing. Babies grow really well in my, in my greenhouse. Now, sundews are all over the world. And there's some of them that live in, um, right near volcanoes and they climb down and they, they live in the heat. There's others that live way up in the Arctic and they, they stay cold frozen all winter long. So they're really interesting that way. Now, coming out of my sundew from last year, I've got this thing here. Don't know if you can see it, but got a white background maybe. Anywho, there, see that stalk? If you remember last week, I showed you the flowers on an orchid. Last year, this produced little white flowers and the flowers have dried and they produce seeds. And that's how carnivorous plants, just like orchids and just like maple trees, reproduce. And they got little things, and I can't, I doubt if I'll be able to get any in there, but there's sometimes little tiny seeds in there. And those little tiny seeds land on the moss and they grow into new um, uh, sundews. Now, that's a sundew. There's two kinds. I've got about five kinds in there. Here, how's our time? We're good. Oh, good. Okay. Now, I want to show you 
the killer bunnies. Now, killer bunnies is just the name people say for the fourth kind of carnivorous plant. And if you look here, see all these little flappy pieces of leaf? That's really cool. Those are the leaves of the killer bunnies and these are the flowers. Now the flowers are called killer bunnies because some, wa some weird person um, thinks those look like rabbits. But anyway, they don't really kill bunnies and they're not really killer bunnies, but that's just a funny name. But they catch their bugs by having little, here I'll show, I guess I better show them. On their roots, they've got tiny, tiny little traps. And these traps are like this and they've got hairs outside. And when a little tiny bug goes by in the soil, they open up and close again. Not like a Venus flytrap. That's not really good. They get little doors anyway, and they get trapped inside and then they get digested. So these also are able to eat insects. And those are called, well, um, I don't know if they're the bladder warts or some silly name. Anyway, I like the killer bunnies. There's lots of different kinds. And last but not least, and I'm afraid it's dormant right now, but there's not much, is the one that everybody knows about, and that's the Venus flytrap. Now it's not from Venus, but it does trap flies. You see here, there it is. Now, it's not active. If I do this, it should close, but it's not doing it. There's little hair triggers. It's just finishing off. It'll grow. This will be a really big Venus flytrap in the summertime. It's dormant, too bad, but you get the idea. Now, I've had people, adults, by the way, I say, put your finger in there and they won't do it because they think it'll hurt. Well, it won't hurt. You just go in and it traps around. Now, um, I know it's uh, not very good to show you this right now because it doesn't work. So you have an assignment for this week and your assignment is to go to YouTube and Google, well, you don't Google on YouTube, go to YouTube and type in Venus flytrap. Doesn't matter if you don't know how to spell it, get your parents to spell it or just goof around and learn how to spell it. And then look at a couple of videos or one video and see how these things work. They are really cool. All right, I'm gonna unmute the mics. So, or ask all of you to unmute. This button works. Oops. And if any of you have a question, I think you can just chime in and ask. Maybe, I don't know if Nina, you have one or anyone else. Can you hear us okay? We. Oui. Uh -huh. I heard somebody. <laughs> that was Nina, I believe. En français. En français. Oui. En français, oui. <laughs> well done, Jess. I think we have a classroom too. So any questions about carnivorous plants, what they like to eat or um, oui, desert what plants? What do they like to eat? What do they like to eat? <laughs> Terry can tell you. We saw some flies, but what else? They um, like flies and yellow jackets and moths and uh, any insect at all that flies. But they don't, they don't eat slugs. Yesterday we found a slug in one of the pitcher plants and it was quite alive. Oh All right, my. we have some chats here. We have some chats. Okay, um, from Eva's class, our microphone is not working unfortunately, but we are wondering how long Venus flytraps can live for. Venus flytraps live for a long, long time. The problem is people sell Venus flytraps and they don't tell you how to look after them. So there's lots out for sale in the stores and you buy a little Venus flytrap and you put it in water and it lives and then it starts to die. And everybody thinks, oh no, my Venus flytrap is dead and they throw it out. Well, you shouldn't do that because it's just going dormant. What you do, if you buy a Venus flytrap and the leaves start to die, then what you do is you just put it in the window ledge, don't let it dry out, but don't sit it in too much water. Don't let it dry out in the next spring, boom, more leaves. And it's even bigger then and much bigger traps. So that's, so they can live. This Venus flytrap here is 15 years old, but look at him. He doesn't oh, look like me. 15 years old. Do you know like a max the, the lifespan for the Venus flytraps or? No, no. I think what happens, Venus flytraps are like a lot of plants and that is they grow and then they break off into more plants. So they really don't, and these little plants then grow so they can, in a kind of way, I guess some Venus flytraps have lived almost forever because they were some of the ones they collected in the 1800s um, in America are still alive in the Kew Gardens in um, England. So there you go. There you go. So we have another good question here. Someone asked if plants make their own food through photosynthesis, why do they need to eat insects? 
Oh yeah, well, good question. <laughs> Science, they think they need um, uh, extra nitrogen because a lot of the places they live in like bogs and things don't have enough of some of the nutrients. So they eat insects to supplement their, because in, in wetland situations, like in sphagnum bogs, there's not many nutrients, right? So they have to get nutrients extra places. Cool. Just like us, we can't <laughs> live on peanut butter. <laughs> so another classroom is wondering where you get your plants, Terry. I, well, I've been collecting, good question. I get them all over the place. Sometimes I buy them from people and then I grow them. Other times I collect them. I, as a botanist, I collected some of these guys way up in Northern Ontario. Two years ago, I went up to the muskeg up there and I collected these and I'm growing them. But most of the time, I don't remember where I got some of them, but I'm very good at growing them. So maybe I bought one and now I have 50 of them, right? And I sell them to a few nurseries so they can sell them to people. I got the um, raging bunnies or the killer bunnies from my friend Nikki, who has lots of uh, plants as well. She, she grows all sorts of carnivorous plants plus desert plants. A lot of us do the same thing. We like plants that like dry and like wet. We're, we're silly sometimes. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah, there is one. I just, hang on a second. Here it is. Um, Eva's class is wondering which carnivorous plant can eat the biggest insects? Do you know? Probably the one I don't have, which I unfortunately lost because it got too cold. There's a, there's a, type of carnivorous plant that lives in the jungles called Nepenthes. Now, I don't know what the common name is for that, but Nepenthes grows as a vine and produces these huge, sometimes small pitchers, but some of them are huge. And they hang upside down and apparently they found dead mice in them and Whoa. so forth. So um, I, maybe they just drowned because a mouse should be able to eat its way through inside <laughs> of it. But those are the ones that can eat the biggest ones. And they've Yikes. seen moths this size being caught in them, but also tiny moths. <laughs> Cool, they're gonna look that one up. Um, someone else is wondering which plant eats fruit flies. Ah, these guys love fruit flies, Drosera. If you have this, the problem is, is you have this in your house and you don't, all of these have to be in a container of water underneath so they stay wet, they can't dry out. If you have this in your house, it's so dry that all these little globs will dry up. That's just the way it is. So you have to keep it. Maybe you've had a little aquarium in your kitchen. It would eat fruit flies. But you know the best way to get rid of fruit flies. Um, what was that joke? I heard a kid's joke. Anyway, um, the best way to get rid of fruit flies is if you get a banana peel, right? And you take that banana peel and you put it in your oven on a tray. And then you keep it there, but keep your oven open just a little bit. And then in the morning, close the oven and turn on the heat. And there'll be lots of fruit flies in there and they'll just disappear, mind you. They might fall to the bottom of your oven and someday you may eat some of the skeletons, but I don't think. 